Well, hello, PCR Online. I'm Mirvat al Asnaj, an interventional cardiologist, and with me, a renowned interventional cardiologist, Dr. Ferdinand uh, Kemene, who is the father of radial access. And we're here to celebrate 30 years of radial artery interventions and uh, coronary angiography. How are you today? Great, thank you. Very happy to be here. Well, thank you for taking the time to be with us, but I do want to take our audience on your radial journey. So how did radial come about? You know, going from femoral, how did you even consider radial access? Well, y the, 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 the pioneering years of stenting, you remember that uh, we had to use uh, large bore catheters in deep running arteries in the groin, sometimes very deep. Uh, and we were implanting stents. Uh, in my time, the, uh, the, uh, the were palma shot stents. They were <coughs> crimped, th they, they were manually crimped on balloons and uh, later uh, we had those stent delivery systems. They were, I think, eight and nine French compatible. And uh, it was very difficult to find the balance between proper anticoagulation in order to prevent stent thrombosis, usually massive and aggressive regimens with aspirin, heparin, coumadin, dextran. And on the other hand, trying to find the balance between hemostasis and stent thrombosis, you know, and that was very difficult. So always the patient were, were lying in bed for a couple of days more often before you could remove the sheath. And when removing the sheath, you had to compress for a long time in order to prevent uh, groin bleeding. But that, that did not go very well. In, uh, in, our, uh, in our experience, so in the late 80s, we had, uh, in the Bain stent study, you know, that was the first randomized study between balloon angioplasty and stenting. We had 20% uh, major bleeding complication, one in five patients. <coughs> and some of the, those patients didn't survive. They ended up with multi-organ failure. We had to uh, uh, reverse anticoagulation. We had problems with stent thrombosis and so on and so on. So that was quite dramatic. And there was worldwide research done on how to prevent bleeding, how to prevent stent thrombosis. And <coughs> just in that time, it was in 1989, Lucien Campo, Professor Lucien Campo from the Montreal Heart Institute, uh, he wrote quite a modest article on uh, f uh, coronary angiography with five French catheters via the radial artery. And um, actually that was, um, uh, that was published uh, amidst all those problems with stenting. And we were very far from stenting via five French catheters. There weren't even six French catheters, but the, interest, the, the idea was very interesting. And so I had to wait six French catheters because I thought the best way to avoid the groin bleeding is not to touch the groin. So actually, I think Lucien Campo is the father of transradial access. I copied his work, but not for coronary angiography, but now for balloon angioplasty and stenting. I used his protocol. And we went from that to brachial as well. So brachial artery, um, at some point in time, was used with cut downs yeah. and so on. Yeah. Um, again, the it seemed like necessity brought about innovation. Because we were trying to avoid thrombosis and bleeding, we needed to find innovative ways to reach the coronary arteries. Brachial was one of them. I do believe um, cut downs were an issue as well. Yes. Uh, I, I think the um, uh, Seldinger technique, the femoral Seldinger technique, was an innovation on brachial cut down. And uh, yeah, that was the technique where we were all trained in, in those years, in the 80s in femoral puncture. And if we continue to look at the progress of transradial, so we went from six French where you were at least able to do angioplasties to the point where we were able to deliver stents to the point where we're able to do complex interventions through radial yes. access, biradial to do CTOs, chronic total mm -hmm. occlusions, 
um, all of the complex atherectomies are now doing, are being done through uh, radial access. What changed that permitted this? What were the changes, tangible changes, that permitted us to do all of this? Well, in, in, in the pioneering years, um, uh, doing transradial interventions, we, 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 we uh, uh, started to understand that you could do all kinds of pathology, actually. Uh, but the devices were sometimes too big mm -hmm. uh, to be used via six French catheter. Uh, so in the course of time, I think material development played a very important role. And um, uh, here our uh, Japanese colleagues, uh, especially uh, here united in the Slender Club Japan, I don't know if yes, you've heard yes, of that. They, they are heroes in downsizing miniature miniaturizing materials and to adapt the technique to working with very uh, uh, small catheters, small wires, smaller balloons. It's, um, uh, yeah, it's a way, it's a combination between material development and, and, and development of skills. And uh, yeah, that has actually brought us to a point where there are no limitations in terms of pathology that you can do. The only hard uh, 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 demand is that the patient should have an open radial artery Absolutely. and then you can start. And you know we talked about French sizes and so on but there was also parallel development in the catheters that gave us the support to do the complex interventions yes. and so we were not reliant solely on Judkins catheters to, to perform uh, radial interventions. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on those? Well, yeah, that is an interesting question because uh, I think all the pioneers from the early years had their own catheter. Yeah. I had my Kimni catheter. Yes, I do. And we have the Vajedek curve and uh, uh, Tift Mann, he was also one of the first. He developed a, sp a special um, uh, multipurpose catheter and so on and so on. Um, but in the course of time, you also start to understand that uh, you can use all the femoral shapes. And some are more suitable for the radial work. Uh, extra backup catheters are very uh, popular. Uh, you can uh, switch amplets right for the left and left for the right. And so there are very many modes to increase, uh, to increase support. But I must say that in Today, support is not an issue any, anymore because the, the stents are really very low profile. Here, remember here, uh, what I said uh, in, the, in the early days, we had to manually crimp, crimp. the stents on the balloon so they could slip off. Yes. And if, if the catheter was not properly aligned, you know, you just ended up with a lost stent in the coronary artery, then there were all kinds of techniques to get them out. And uh, um, yeah, that was a headache. But it forced us to become better operators because we really had to know how to handle the catheter, uh, what is the best position of the catheter in relation to the coronary artery. You know, that, yeah, that, that um, uh, I, I think it improved skills. Yes. You know, I would be remiss if we don't bring up distal radial access as well, which has taken up in the last few years. And I think it is important with a pioneer like yourself to discuss how does Intervention is based on innovation and trying something new. So how do we balance innovation, exploring the uncharted territories, and evidence, generating the evidence that proves the safety and outcomes in our patients? Yeah, that's, uh, yeah it's, it's a good question. And on the other side, I don't think it's a good discussion. Because, like you said, innovation starts with innovating doing something new. When doing something new, there is no evidence. The only evidence that you have is the contact with the patient. If the patient feels well, for the patient the whole procedure was a piece of cake. But for you it was really blood, sweat and tears because you had to do many difficult things. Distal puncture, a new, new tortuosity, um, uh, a different approach shorter length, uh, longer length, you know, before you get to the uh, coronary artery. That's all your problem. But when you are um, uh, becoming proficient and familiar with the technique, then you, you just take that as easy as a conventional radial. 
you start improving. And only then, much later, if you see that there are benefits, and you see that in, the, in your own Absolutely. clinic, and you, you, you see that in the, and you hear that in the discussion with the patient, if you're convinced that this is better than the standard, then you start to publish, to present feasibility studies, and then there are registries, and in the end, when you have a nice group of proficient operators, you can discuss with them, shall we try to compare with the standard? But not too early. Absolutely. Evidence comes later. I, I agree with you absolutely, and I think we do look at radial and see that radial took its process. Mm -hmm. when, the genera when the evidence was generated, we were able the matrix trial and so on, telling yeah, us about exactly. safety and so on, and mm -hmm. now it made it into the guidelines. Yes, and yes, all yes, the guidelines yes. now mm -hmm. uh, you know, prioritize radial over yeah. peripheral access, even in STEMI and particularly in high-risk patients. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where the next innovation, where do you see the next innovation in radial artery access? You know, we're looking at peripheral interventions, endovascular interventions as well. What are your thoughts there? Well, um, I, I hope it won't take 30 years before this yes. radial becomes the standard. Um, I hope we, um, uh, yeah, th this technique will uh, popularize faster because, and that appears to be the case, it appears to be the case because there's no final hard proof but that radial artery occlusion rate, and that's the big enemy of radial. The radial artery occlusion rate is extremely low. It's far under 1%. And it will appear from randomized tri trials as well. Uh, so I don't, I don't see that there's, I, I cannot imagine an other uh, innovation in terms of the access technique or site but um, yeah, there's a very interesting development, and that is the use of transradial in other fields, uh, IR and uh, neuro IR. Um, and, um, uh, you know, the, the radiologists who are starting with radial, they don't have all that history that right. we as cardiologists have. The, all the evidence is there, all the tools are there and uh, all the skills are there so it's very easy to pick up and even for distal radial i have friends who, who started from femoral to distal immediately our yeah, the, the 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 young fellows today they don't know anything else than radial or i'm sure uh, in some hospitals they don't they never tried something else than distal radial absolutely but they have to learn femoral again so the circle, <laughs> circle is round. <laughs> the circle <laughs> makes a full circle. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I mean, you know, as an operator, I also, w with structural heart and so yeah. on, we do want to be able to do interventions in the ileus, yeah. femorals, and so on. I think our current limitation is the length, shaft length of the yeah. um, devices that we need, and perhaps we can work with industry to look into shaft length. Yes. Um, because even when you're doing a structural intervention, TAVI or what have you, you do want your radial to be your backup site yeah. to secure your iliacs and so on. Um, and so that is something, as an operator, I'm hoping uh, radial will go very soon into that area as well. I hope so too. And I think that we as cardiologists should use ultrasound more for yes. uh, getting uh, radial access at least. Mm -hmm. That's something we have learned. Yeah, from from, from uh, radiologists, they, they don't understand why we are never using ultrasound. It's so standard in yes. their practice. Yes. And uh, we more or less uh, proud on our skills. Say, well, it's not necessary. <laughs> you, know, you, don't, you, don't, you don't need ultrasound. But I'm sure that it helps. And it certainly helps on going distal because you know exactly where to the snuff box is not the area where you want to poke around with your needle you need to go straight to your target and doing that under ultrasound guidance yeah that makes uh, that makes it a lot easier and safer absolutely and and i really want to thank you for your time today i think um, personally now that i have some administrative roles i'm seeing radial access help in that area as well so it's not just about patient safety and um, so on but it's also a faster pay uh, you know table yes. turnover mm -hmm. uh, same day discharges yes cost, uh, cost efficiency effective. so yeah. there's a lot um, that radial has brought about yeah. uh, in the ca in, a, in a modern day cath lab 
um, and, and hoping that there's more research that can support these. Um, will come. What we see. The research yeah, will follow. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today in celebrating 20 years of radio. And here we are with Dr. Kimene. Follow us during EuroPCR for more on radios.